Hi, my name is Eric Lee, and today I'm going to talk about implementing synchronization objects. So first, our goal is to implement logs and condition variables. As we have seen in the last lecture, we know how to use logs and condition variables. To implement them, we need to use, we need to atomically modify the states of logs and condition variables. For example, for logs, it can be either free or busy, and it also maintains a queue of waiting threads. Condition variables also maintain a queue of waiting threads. So to implement this, we are going to use hardware primitives. For example, we may be using disabling interrupt for unit processors, and we are going to use atomic instructions in multiprocessors. This discussion will mainly focus on implementing logs and conditional variables in kernel mode. And at last, we are going to talk about how to implement them in user mode. So first, when we are implementing logs in unit processors, we are just going to disable the interrupts. It's very easy because no other processors can change memory. So after we disable the interrupts, there cannot be context switch, so operations in one thread appears to be atomic. So the trivial implementation looks like this. According to the log, it's just disabling the interrupts. Releasing the log, it's just enabling the interrupt. However, there's a problem with this implementation, because if you disable the interrupt for a long time, other thread will go into starvation, and it's not a real-time system design. Also, you cannot allow user-level code to disable interrupts because they may just hang up and the operating system freezes. So to have a better design, we implement uniprocessor queuing logs. The idea is that we briefly disable the interrupt to protect the log's data structure. And when the log is already logged, we don't wait on it and we just context switch to another thread that is ready. So this is how it's implemented. We, we are acquiring the log, we are disabling interrupts, and we test whether the log is busy. If it's not busy, we are just going to set the value to busy and enable interrupts. If it is busy, we add the current thread into the waiting list and set the current thread to waiting. We choose a thread in the ready list and switch to this new thread. And then we set the new thread state to running and continue to enable interrupts. When we release the log, we, uh, we disable the interrupts. We check whether there's something in the waiting list. If so, we set it to ready. And if not, we set the value to free and then enable the interrupts. So one thing to notice is that we don't set value to free in the release function here, even though the log is actually free. This is to prevent starvation because uh, when we execute this, on this line, another new thread may jump in and take the execution opportunity. Also, when we are calling the thread switch, the interrupts are turned off so that uh, so that there will be no race condition. So to implement multiprocessor spin locks, we cannot turn off the interrupt because uh, in multiprocessor, if you turn off the interrupt, other CPUs will still change the memory. And so we are going to use the atomic read, modify, write instructions. Its implementation is related to cache and it's out of the operating system scope. You can learn it in computer architecture classes like CS154B or probably 201 here at UC Davis. Or you can learn something about it in this paper written by someone in the FreeBSD team. 
the instruction we are going to use is called atomic test and set instruction. It's similar to this, but it's done atomically. So you have you have a pointer here, you read it into the old value, and then you set it to the new value. Then you return the old value to the user. So how can we use this to implement a multiprocessor spin lock? So the spin lock just have a value which indicates whether it's free or busy. And then when you acquire the spin lock, you're going to forever do the test and set instruction on this value. So if the lock is free, which means the value is zero, and you set it, which has a default value like setting it to one, then you will receive a zero and you exit the while loop. However, if there are two threads acquiring the log at the same time, one thread will get one returned at this test and set instruction. So it will continue spinning. We are releasing the log, you just set value to zero. So the problem with this design is that it's implementing busy wait. So it is assumed that logs are going, only going to be held shortly. So to prevent the problem of this design, we have to design keying logs for multiprocessors. And if we implement keying logs, we can, so now the critical sections can be longer or it can be variable length and we can minimize busy waiting, though we cannot completely remove the busy waiting. Here are the class definitions for multiprocessor queuing logs. We have a log class, which have whether it's free or busy value, and it has a spin log to protect its structure, data structure. It also has a queue for the waiting thread. And we also have a scheduler class, which has a ready list a list of threads and also a spin log for protecting this queue. So here are the implementations. Uh, I'm not going to the details of all these functions, but let's look at the example. So for example, a log, a, a thread calls log.acquire and then the log is already acquired. So it checks the log's value. It's not free because it's busy. So it's going to enter this if loop, this if uh, condition, and then it's going to call scheduler.suspend. And at that time, it's not going to release the current spin log it's acquiring here. And in scheduler.suspend, it's going to disable the interrupts to prevent the thread from being preempted. And then it's going to acquire the scheduler's spin lock. And then it's going to do all the instructions. So what if we don't release the spin lock? Uh, sorry, what if we release the spin lock before calling the scheduler.suspend? Like, here we just add spinlock.release and we don't release it here. So if that is the case, then we release the spinlock and then maybe another thread may come in and it's going to call log.release and then it sees, it sees that waiting list is not empty. So it tries to make the next thread empty which goes here and the thread dot state, which is the first thread state, it's going to be ready. And then after the second thread is complete, the first thread executes the scheduler dot suspend and here it sets its state to waiting. And after that, 
the this thread's state will be always be waiting. And like they are similar to a deadlock and the system cannot proceed. So it's kind of a risk condition that it's very difficult to be hacked. That's why we have to release the lock here. So the book also talks about the kernel motex lock in Linux 2.6. This motex locks it's optimized for the common case, which is based on the assumption that most locks are free most of the time. So for acquiring the lock, the fast path, which is the like most common path is when the lock is not already acquired. And in that situation, you only need two instructions to acquire the lock. If the lock is already acquired, you are going to do the slow path. It's going to take a long time, but since most of the cases we are in the fast path, so the system is still fast enough. When releasing the lock, the fast path is when there are no waiters on the lock, and still it only needs two instructions to release the lock. So now let's take a look at how to implement condition variables. It's similar to implementing locks. So it's still going to use the scheduler class we discussed before, and the condition variable have just a waiting queue, and when you're waiting on the conditional variable, you're passing the mutex log to the conditional variable. It's going to check whether the log is already held, and then it's going to add the current thread to the waiting list, and then it's going to suspend the current thread using the same same way to pass the log to the scheduler to prevent that risk condition. And then it's going to, like after this, like if it completes waiting, then it's going to acquire the log again. And here, if you're signaling on a conditional variable, it's going to check whether the waiting list is empty. If it's not empty, it's going to get one thread from the waiting list and make it ready. If you're broadcasting on the conditional variable, it's going to um, make all the threads in that waiting list empty. We should have learned it in yesterday's class. So now we have talked about implementa implementing synchronization in kernel level. So now let's talk about implementing it in application level. As we have seen, there are two ways to implement uh, thread libraries in application level. One is kernel managed threads. And if we are doing synchronization here, we can just place all the logs and conditional variables in the kernel space and the application just use system calls to perform all these, all these operations. However, if we want to get more performance, we can just uh, write things similar to the Linux implementation. We put the fast path in the user space, like just two two instructions to unlock or to lock. However, if a lock is already taken, we are going to do the slow path in the kernel. Another way to implement is user managed threads. So we are going to implement more things at the user level. And the only thing we cannot implement at user level is disabling interrupts. It all it happens both in uni, unicore and multicore. So what we will replace it with is temporarily disabling all the up calls, which is for switching threads. Though other interrupts will still go through, it will not affect the, the thread library. 
and temporarily disabling app calls is usually supported by modern operating systems. So that's all of my presentation. Thank you very much.